Hello, this is the first video of the new year for European history. Uh, we are starting Unit 3. Uh, some housekeeping things. Tomorrow I will have, uh, or I plan to have new seating charts posted, and you will be signing into the seats that you take. So, um, the seats you choose today, or whatever changes you want to make, make them by tomorrow morning. First. Secondly, uh, you have until the Friday before midterms to get any owed work that you may have. Your work is going to take a late penalty. I tried getting all of it in before the holidays, but uh, what we have is what we've got. So uh, for those of you who still owe work and want to get it in, you've got to do so before um, that Friday, because that is the end of the quarter, and that is the last time I'm going to be taking work. Uh, let's see. Can I have a volunteer or two to hand out work, please, while I lecture? Otherwise, I will select you. Thank you. I start by showing my no name around. And, sir, please pass this back to Mr. Peter. Thank you. Anyone who's not here, just put it in this open folder right up front. Unit 3 is where we really begin to see a shift into modern lifestyles. In Unit 1, we moved away from medievalism in terms of our thoughts. We began considering a possible society where your, de your identity was not determined by your father's job, or your husband's job, or your brother's job, or birth status. Where you might become the agent of your own fate. We also considered a society that wasn't theocentric. Where God and his church may inspire things but isn't at the center of every interaction, which had been the case in the Middle Ages. This involves the printing press, uh, the exploration of the world, um, the Protestant Reformation, 150 years on and off of religious war, and a scientific revolution that moved the Earth from the center of the universe to the status of merely one of many planets and possibly one of para infinite uh, star systems. So in thought, and to an extent in terms of our culture, we had shifted. In Unit 2, there was a hardcore turn away from European norms. With the demise of church power, or at least its limitation, the kings saw their chance to get what they'd always wanted during the Middle Ages. Unlimited power! Power without end. Power without a church restraining them. Power without the moral limits that the church placed on state power. This is one of the funny things to me about modern people. Contemporary people look at the separation of church and state to the extent it exists, turn the heat up a little bit, as an implied doctrine of our founding fathers, because those words never appear in any of the founding documents. But they look at the separation of church and state as something to preserve poor little state from evil, scary religion. That's funny. Do you know how hard the church had to work in the Middle Ages to be relevant when the church's army was one of the smallest in Europe, when the church's power came from moral suasion and not coercion? Once the church pulled back, the state reached for unfettered, unlimited power. Because what does the government do? It makes laws, and it enforces those laws with the coercive power of the state. In other words, do what I say, or I'll pound you. The church today is atomized. It is caught on the horns of a, a dilemma 
between radical fundamentalism on the one hand that engages in easy and quick judgments based on rule books, and on the other hand, liberation theology, which combines Marx and communism with Christ. Every mainline church, Roman Catholic, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Congregational, Wesleyan, and so forth, is divided and divided and divided by these and other controversies. And even if the church had power, was unified in doctrine and practice, it has no army. It is not the poor little state that needs to be preserved from the evil, scary church. Au contraire. It is the church and the individual that needs to be preserved from state power. That is what Unit 2 was about. When the European monarchs, with their opportunity provided by the demise of an equal church, with the inspiration of Japan and China, when they reached to establish absolute monarchy, to destroy the power of guilds, of city governments, of noblemen, of middle class people, of anyone that would threaten or could threaten their power, claiming that the state is a body, a giant life form, a leviathan, a nation state is a leviathan, and that in the leviathan, not all cells can be members of the central nervous system. And if you're not a member of the central nervous system, stinks to be you, shut up and do what you're told. This is not in the European tradition. This came as a carnival mirror caricature of Asian ideas taken out of their cultural context and rendered basically as an excuse, a pretext for a power grab. And what it provokes is the philosophical enlightenment where people of all kinds try to figure out what is the nature of reality, not through theology, not through a study of Christian scripture, but rather through observation and reason to suss out the nature of nature's God and nature's laws. And it is from this assessment of natural law, of self-evident truth, that we get John Locke, to an extent Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Thomas Jefferson. Why do we hold these truths to be self-evident? Because we've looked around. We've looked at humanity in the context of nature. We've looked at human society, not through the blind straitjacket of tradition, but we've tried to reevaluate and reassess everything we do. And in that reevaluation and reassessment, in that observing of, human, of the human animal in the context of the natural world, it is self-evident that there is not a royal class of human being distinct from peasants, distinct from townsmen. Now, science in the form of genetic engineering augmentation and other cutting edge and uh, near future science fiction type of processes may very well at some point produce a homo superior, homo sapiens superior with the best genes and the best wetware linked to the best computers with a lifespan of centuries. And at that point, watch the hell out. Because unless you're one of them, and I don't see any of them in this room, your status as a free and equal person will be over. That is a nightmare dystopian future scenario that hopefully will never occur, but it could. But at this point in the 18th century, the philosophical enlightenment did not observe a race of superior human beings. And if all men are created equal, then why is inherited hierarchy the basis of authority? Furthermore, 
What are these people created to do? They're endowed with certain inalienable rights, rights you cannot separate without being immoral. Among these are life. What God has given, you can't take away righteously, not without a very, very, very good reason. Thou shalt not kill. We are born, we are conceived. To take another human life is a grave, grave, grave matter. The exceptions that traditionally Jews and Christians abided are war and capital punishment. If there's a war, you fight, you kill. If somebody commits crimes that are so heinous that they weren't the death penalty, they are executed. That is not murder. If you want to know why abortion is the rock upon which our republic may very well founder, it's because this isn't just a question of what is inside a human body that happens to be female. The question is, is that creature, that combination of sperm and egg that has become a growing mass of cells, at what point does it become a human being? And if it is a human being at some point within the womb, do you have a right to end that life for your own sake? On the other hand, who owns you? If you're a woman and you are pregnant, you obviously have a claim on that life that no one else exactly has. Not even the father, because the baby's not growing inside of him, it's growing inside of you. If we were to clone organs so that we could live longer lives, so that we wouldn't have to rely on the Chinese Communist Party or harvesting organs from political dissidents. It's conceivable that you could go to the doctor and order a clone body to be grown, or cloned organs to be grown. And the question there would become, does that cloned body that you're using as an organ bank, that you built and created as an organ bank, have a soul? Have you, in fact, created life to use it in a form of slavery worse than anything that was ever achieved in the American South before the Civil War? Growing a life form strictly to harvest its organs, giving it no scope, no future, no possibility of anything other than to live to serve you. These moral questions are real. And if and as science continues to advance at a time when we may be scientific giants, but we are moral midgets, at a time when the consensus in Western civilization is shakier than it has been since the Protestant Reformation about what is life, what is good, what is evil, what is acceptable, and what is taboo. You're going to have to wrestle with these things as a citizen, maybe even as an individual, depending upon how quickly the science develops and how long you live. What is human life? Well, Jefferson and Locke assert that life is something that we have and should not be taken away from us except in extreme circumstances. Liberty. We are not insects in a hive. We are not ants in a hill. We are not designed to be drones. Except for those who are afflicted with disability, we are thinking beings, sentient beings, self-aware beings. You know, people say, and you're going to study communism and its development in this unit, that communism is a great idea. Yeah, it is for insects, not for people. Because what it requires is a degree of conformity that offends the individual sensibility. You are not allowed to think. In a utopia that is given to you, you are supposed to accept it. Accept it. Not weigh it not analyze it, not judge it. It's utopia. It's perfect. Who are you to judge utopia? Who are you to question what has been given you? The idea that liberty, that liberty is an inalienable right, comes from this fact that we are self-aware sentient creatures that we can think, that we do think. And honestly, if your answer to every problem in the world is laws 
control. You've got to question your commitment to freedom. Because a commitment to freedom involves accepting that people are going to do stupid things that you don't agree with, and that they have every right to do that, to think that, and to say that. If the problem with the world is all down to people making stupid decisions, then you don't believe in freedom, ultimately. You believe in some form of control, some form of authoritarianism, some form of tyranny or totalitarianism that will force people into the mold that you think is best for them. Well... This is what the Enlightenment resisted. It insisted on liberty. Property is the means by which an individual expresses their choices. It is the means by which an individual remains self-supporting and not at the mercy of some form of government or authority. It is the way a person becomes fully adult. Until you have your own property, you are beholden to whoever's property you're using. If it's your lords, if it's your parents, while you're under their roof, follow their rules. If you don't follow their rules, they have every right to kick you out. And as to vehicles, take the bus if you can't afford a car. When you have your own stuff, when you have earned it, you get to decide. When you are using someone else's stuff, well, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Jefferson and Locke understood this. Property is the way by which we express our choices by deciding where to place resources and where not to. It's the way we protect ourselves from the powerful because we have our own independent, we're not dependent upon them. But Jefferson did not want property to, be used, property to be used by slave owners as an excuse to perpetuate slavery, which Jefferson wanted to get rid of in 1776. So he confounds the language and calls it the pursuit of happiness. But property is the pursuit of happiness. I'm not speaking like a materialist. I am saying that morally what property is, is the reward for your labor. It is the security against difficulties. It is the protection you have against the power. And is the way by means you express your pursuit of happiness. Whether that happiness is to get married, have children, and raise them right, or whether it's to travel the world, or whether it's to uh, become the leader of your own business, self-employed, your own master, or whatever it is. The pursuit of happiness involves the pursuit of property, not merely as a material gain, but as a moral quality. These ideas run in the face of absolute monarchy and produce political revolution in these United States and a cultural revolution or, or social revolution in France. Unfortunately for the French, they had an old society. Our revolution was successful because America, in, its, in the form of the 13 colonies, was an overwhelmingly middle-class society. There were some slaves, there were some indentured servants, there were a very, 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 very few transplanted aristocrats, but in general terms, people were self-made. They didn't rely upon that much inherited wealth. They relied upon their own abilities to earn through their skills and through their labor. Independent, middle-class-minded people don't expect the government to take care of them. They don't expect anyone to take care of them. They don't want anyone to take care of them. They want the freedom to make the important choices in their life. And that freedom to make important choices is key. Whereas in France, you have people who for thousands of years, in some cases, back before Roman times, lived as peasants on someone else's lands, were never given as a family an opportunity to do anything other than work in the fields. And on the other hand, you have families going back at least a thousand, fifteen hundred years in some cases, maybe even more, who ruled. The existence of a peasantry and an aristocracy in France in some ways, dooms this revolution. Because the ideals of the Enlightenment are middle-class ideals. 
if you inherit your wealth or if you inherit your bondage. In both cases, it, it's not about you. It's not about your choices. It's about how you're born. There's also a lot of pent-up rage that comes out at the Bastille and all the way up to the time when Napoleon disperses the crowd with a whiff of grape shot. The Paris mob, the head-ripping, pipe-carrying Paris mob. And beyond that, the Committee of Public Safety, citizen Maximilian Robespierre, and the guillotining of everyone who doesn't completely agree with your concept of reality, executing people for saying, good morning, mister, Good afternoon, madam, because everyone should be called citizen for being openly Christian, for being somebody who recognizes when it's Sunday, despite the new calendar, for somebody whose thoughts don't conform with the new orthodoxy. terror and then the great terror make the streets every settlement in France run red the blood of the dissident in the name of freedom the revolution kills anyone who thinks freely and it won't be the last time it also won't be the last time that a, that a, relief, relief, bleh, that a revolution that starts as a political revolution and becomes a social, social revolution, and then a meat grinder that produces nothing but dead bodies and terror, ends in dictatorship. In this case, the dictatorship of a Corsican opportunist named Napoleon, who said nice things about the ideals of liberté, égalité, fraternité, but in fact was after unlimited personal power, not only over his own life, not only over France, but over as much of the world as he could possibly get a hold of. So in the name of freedom, a dictator arises to take total power and comes close to succeeding. Like Hitler, had Napoleon avoided invading Russia, who knows what would have happened in the history of the world. Could he have won? If he hadn't invaded Russia and the British had made peace with him, if he had been able to somehow pay the British off or assure them that he wasn't going to be their enemy, but the British weren't going to do that because the British weren't going to accept Europe under any single dom dominion. The key to Britain's security is having a Europe divided against itself with great power rivalries. Still, if he hadn't invaded Russia, he might have succeeded more than he actually did, which is a scary thought. But all of these things affect ideas, affect cultural interactions, they do not affect the fundamental way of living. The fundamental way of living is essentially the same as it was in ancient Sumeria and Babylon. It is the agrarian social model. You have between 70 and 90% of the people on the land working so that that 10 to 30 percent of the people in the towns and the cities and in other professions than food production can make a culture. People's lives were short, mean, and brutal. The average life expectancy was somewhere around 30. Many places less than 30. So how does Unit 3 change all of that? Because Unit 3 is going to deal with industrialization. The Industrial Revolution is the most important change in human lifestyle that's happened since the Agrarian Revolution 10,000 years ago. The only comparisons in terms of daily life to the Industrial Revolution is the development of spoken language and the development of fire.
as a tool under our control. We as a species master fire to the extent it can be mastered. And there are always limits on that, otherwise we wouldn't need a fire department. We master spoken language. Don't think about how people abuse that. It's a great achievement, it really is. And we master farming. And those three things, those three things, are all that's necessary for the basis of human civilization, which is a culture with cities, specialized workers, writing, advanced technology, and complex institutions of culture, like the family, like the church, like the law, like the military. In effect, the lifestyles of people known by Leonidas of Sparta and the prophet Abraham are more similar to the lives of people who lived under Napoleon than the people who lived under Napoleon are to us. Our lives, in terms of the daily processes of how we go about our business, how we feed ourselves, clothe ourselves, house ourselves, all of the physical instrumentalities that make our lives possible are a product of industry. People laud the organic food world. Fine, you get some very good food that way. And it's much more fun to grow food that way. And it's much more fun if you're keeping cattle or if you're keeping pigs, sheep, or goats to let them live naturally in the fields. But without those horrible cow factories producing inexpensive beef, without those weird hydroponic farms, without all of the chemicals that we use, our global population couldn't exceed a billion people. Probably it would be, it's anywhere between 100 million and a billion people globally. That means that of all the people that you know, six out of seven, maybe seven out of eight, would have to die of starvation. Industry gives us these things. Industry has made it possible. People back in the 1970s were saying, science tells us there'll be a global Malthusian crisis of population where people will starve to death because there simply won't be enough food. They expected that that would happen sometime before 1990. Does this sound at all familiar? Doom crying scientists and their credulous fellow travelers talking about an existential crisis that will happen within 20 years if we don't stop, if we don't change, if we don't have global birth control. The only country on earth that does follow that advice is communist China with its one couple, one child policy which has done almost as much damage to the Chinese people as the Communist Party's other great innovations did. You have a society where girls are killed en masse from the 1970s up until about three or four years ago. Because if a family is going to have a child, they'd better be a guy because the men can take care of the parents in their old age. The men carry on the name of the family, the legacy of the family. If you're going to only have one child, better it be a guy. My best friend's wife has saved thousands of Chinese baby girls by helping them be adopted by American families and Canadian families. Because those families wanted children. And those little girls were left abandoned or in orphanages because the families weren't going to claim a female. And now, after a generation or two of this, what do we have? We have an imbalance in China of military-aged men who can't find wives because there's an unnatural dis uh, parity between the number of men and women in their society to the point where Chinese men are buying wives from the poor countries of Southeast Asia and South Asia, just so that they can have a woman, just so that they can have their own children. Because there aren't enough Chinese girls, because those girls have been devalued systematically for decades. And that's the only time that any government has done population control seriously. And it took a totalitarian police state that's guilty of more mass murder than any other society in human history to do it. And the results are disastrous. The 
food crisis that was predicted never came. In fact, one of the fastest growing diseases in the third world is type 2 diabetes, which I have. Type 2 diabetes is a rich man's disease. It comes from eating too richly and not exercising enough. Type 2 B diabetes is the, one of the fastest growing diseases in the third world. Has been since the end of the Cold War. Why? Because with American aid and aid from Europe and other developed countries, the countries of the third world are getting food they've never had before. And that means that some of them, like me, abuse that privilege and eat too richly and don't exercise enough. That is the opposite of starvation. Industry. All of those chemicals that people decry, all of the ugly factories and smokestacks, the use of water power and coal power and oil power and nuclear power, <laughs> the attempts to use solar and wind power as if they were equivalent to those others, the hope of achieving some kind of fusion power as opposed to the nuclear fission that we depend upon, all of these things produce the life that we have. A life that can support over 7 billion people on the planet and that can give more and more of them the opportunity to live a life that we would call decent in material terms. So we're going to study, and the themes are listed right here on the cover, we're going to study industrialism. And we're going to study the ideology that comes out of industrialism, which is socialism. Like it or not, and I don't, socialism is the great theory of the industrial era. The idea is, if we can organize production into factories, why can't we organize society like a production line, along rational lines? That basically is the summation of socialism. We being the all-powerful few who will make utopia. Industrialism produces socialism, just as absolutism produced, produced the Enlightenment. But there's also a reaction against the hyper-rationality of the Enlightenment. Romanticism, which is not all lovey-dovey stuff. Romanticism is reconnecting with the passionate heart of your humanity. You are not brains in jars, romantics would say. That quality that you feel when you look up at a dramatic cloudscape, or when you encounter a waterfall, or when you see something that touches your heart and makes you cry, that is as intrinsic to your humanity as your capacity to say, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. We are not merely intellects. The passions in us produce horror and wonder. Fear and hate, terror and jealousy, murderous rage, but love, joy, curiosity, wonder. And to strip those qualities from us, to make us some kind of Vulcan, a uh, creature of logic, is the great fault of the Enlightenment, according to the Romantics. A culture must feed the hunger that we have to express our passions and to have those passions be stimulated and inspired. Nationalism. Nationalism is something, again, to an extent it comes out of Asia. The Romans weren't particularly race-oriented. The Greeks weren't either. The Greeks divided the world into civilized people and barbari, bar babblers, barbarians. But what determined a Greek wasn't just that they came from somewhere in Halos. What determined a Greek was their culture. Did they speak Greek well? Did they understand Greek? Did they read the classics? Had they read the Iliad? Anyone can be a Greek if they 
thought like a Greek. Anyone can be a Roman if they thought like a Roman. It's one of the great things about the United States. Anyone can be an American if you think like an American. Now, there was a degree of racialism in the Germans that conquered Rome. Germans saw themselves as members of tribes. They saw the Romans as pathetic people. Millions of Romans allowed themselves to be conquered by tens and hundreds of thousands of Germans and Goths. How weak they were. How strong we are, the Germans and Goths said. And there are differences between Visigoths, Vandals, uh, Franks, Ostrogoths, Lombards, and the various other tribes that come in and end up taking over Europe from the Romans. But when Japan and China were admired by the Europeans, they also learned about the great hatred that Chinese in the North had for Koreans or Japanese had for Koreans, or Koreans had for Chinese and Japanese, that North and South Chinese saw themselves as somehow different, even though they were both Han, they were culturally different. And there was tribalism in Europe. France and Britain had fought each other at least once a century for the last thousand years. It's, it's, it's normal to assume that people in France and people in Britain would start thinking of themselves as different sorts of creatures. The fall of the multinational empire and the rise of the single nation state, a nation state that is Germany for the Germans, Italy for the Italians, Britain for the Britons, France for the French, Italy, um, Spain for the Spanish, and so forth. Nationalism is one reason why the French were so successful under the Republic and under Napoleon. And it awakened nationalism in the rest of Europe. And that nationalism is going to be a powerful force. And finally, imperialism. There are people who look at the word imperialism and all they see are European gunships shooting machine guns into wave after wave of dark-skinned native tribesmen. Everyone builds empires. That picture is a false one. Just like the picture of slavery as being a uniquely institution, uh, American institution involving white and black racism. Everyone who can builds an empire. Almost everywhere, almost everywhere throughout history, you have the rise and fall, not only of civilizations, but of empires. There are empires in the Americas, in Africa, in Asia, and in Europe. Europe's the first to industrialize. And with industry comes superpowers. Whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. The Maxim gun is the world's first fully functional machine gun. Even the development of cartridge firearms Single-shot rifles were enough to conquer the Romans of South Africa, the Zulu nation. There's this theme in movies and stories about people trying to take over the world. There was an old cartoon back in the 90s called Pinky and the Brain, and they were mice. And uh, Pinky was sort of the sidekick. What are we going to do? That's more than I brain. And the brain would say, you know, it's a little guy with this giant head, same thing we try to do every night, Pinky, try and take over the world. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, I saw that over break because my grandparents were watching it. It's funny. <laughs> it's funny. I watched it. And I wasn't a kid. I didn't watch it religiously, but I watched it occasionally. It was hilarious. I may show you little bits of it. But um, it's been done. Before World War One. There were barely, depending upon how you define it, a handful of countries that weren't under the control of Europe or former European colonials like the United States. Less than five, fewer than five countries. One of these countries is Liberia, a country uh, founded by black African slaves that had been freed by the abolitionists and sent back to Africa. 
And the uh, former American slaves treated the natives that they ruled over like slaves. Go figure. Another one of these countries was Ethiopia. At the source of the Blue Nile, Ethiopia. A country that is, has a Christian faith older than either the Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox variants of Christianity. Ethiopia, a country that is the legendary kingdom of Prester John and medieval tales. But Ethiopia is left unconquered because the Italians got their butts kicked when they tried, but also because um, there's nothing there but sand in Ethiopia. There's no oil, there's no... It, it, it's, it's, it's a very poor country. So Liberia, ruled over by westernized Africans who were sent back from America to Africa. Ethiopia, a country ruled by an African king, um, has a land that's so remote and so uh, poor that nobody wants to take it over. Tibet, in the high Himalayan mountains and on the plateau north of them, ruled by the Dalai Lama and the Buddhist monks. China's an interesting one. China would have been divided up into a variety of European colonies if it hadn't been for the United States. In the early decade of the uh, last decades of the 19th and the early decades of the 20th century, Americans insisted on what was called the open door policy. The open door policy says now China will be kept as an independent European, uh, unitary empire where we can all exploit it equally. Had that not happened, had we not pushed for China to remain a unified country, there's no question in my mind that somewhere between 1895 and 1914, China would have been carved up by the Germans, the French, the British, the Russians, the Japanese, and us. Maybe even the Austrians and the Italians. We get no credit for this, by the way, from China. Except maybe in Taiwan. There's a fifth country. Can't remember it right now, but I will. All of North and South America ruled by former Europeans, colonials. Europe, obviously, ruled by Europeans. All of Africa is divided up among the Europeans in the late 1800s. Uh, Asia, too, with the exception of Tibet and China, is divided up. Everywhere in the world has been conquered by Western civilization. It's been nuts. Unit 4, by the way, is the story of how the West loses all of that, among other things. So this unit is going to deal with changes to everyday life. It's going to deal with a new way of thinking that's very industrial. It's going to deal with the notion that the Enlightenment was wrong because it de-emphasized the non-intellectual side of human beings. Nationalism, the idea that if you are of one language and one culture, you should have maybe one race, you should have your own country. And imperialism, where Europe conquers the world. That's what's coming. Take a look in your notes near the end. You'll see two maps, 1815 and 1914. 1815 and 1914. Yep. A little before that. Here we go. Good. We're going to compare these two just to give you a before and after picture. It's like the old advertisements. This is Mr. Genorio before the diet plan. This is Mr. Genorio after the diet plan. <laughs> so it's a before and the after. Uh, although 1914, well, it's the, it's the end of a progression. So, uh, Britain uh, is now the United Kingdom of uh, Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, but that isn't much of a change. Let's look in the north. Uh, Sweden ruled over the northern part of Scandinavia, north of the Baltic Sea. But in 1914, Norway had broken away. Denmark shrinks a little bit with the expansion of, uh, of Germany. We're going sort of clockwise around. The Russian Empire is the Russian Empire. 
uh, Krakow in southern Poland uh, becomes uh, Russian. And it's remarkably similar. The Ottoman Empire. Ooh, that has some problems. The Turks have difficulties. Because like much of the Middle East, like in fact, <laughs> since it rules the Middle East, uh, like the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire is in a form of technological and cultural stagnation. It and Spain follow a similar path. In the 1500s, Spain was the most dynamic of the European powers. Wealthy, powerful, controlled Central and South America, had massive gold reserves. Uh, its royal family controlled the Holy Roman Empire in the heart of Europe. And the Ottoman Turks twice reached uh, Vienna. The Ottoman Turks were, the, in, in, in many ways, the strongest European country in the early 1500s, even though they weren't Christian. They weren't part of Western civilization. However, from the 1600s on, a form of stagnation sets in in Spain, Portugal, and in the Ottoman Empire. The plasticity of mind required to think new ways, adapt new ways of doing things, whether they're technological improvements or cultural innovations that are going to allow people's talents to be more fully expressed. They don't exist that much in Spain or in the Ottoman Empire. One can speculate as to reasons for this, but the Ottoman Turks lose Greece, Albania, Montenegro, Serbia, Bulgaria, and Romania. The only part of Turkey and Europe that's left is the part from Constantinople to Adrianople. This little nub in northwestern Turkey. Turkey is called the sick man of Europe because it is weak and ultimately it is propped up by the British Empire. Make deals with it for oil as the 20th century dawns. Down in Africa, the Ottomans have lost control of Egypt and Cyprus. British control both of them. Local rulers in Tunis and Tripoli have been conquered by the Itais, the Italians. Algiers has been conquered by the French, as has much of Morocco, except for the Spanish regions of Morocco near Gibraltar. Spain and Portugal are largely the same. So we've gone around the periphery of Europe clockwise from Britain to Portugal. Now let's look towards the center. France in 1815, after Napoleon, and France, the French Republic, uh, at the dawn of the First World War, is basically the same size, except it has taken some areas in Italy, from uh, Savoy and the Italians, but it has lost uh, an area where it faces Germany called Alsace-Lorraine. The Kingdom of the Netherlands has divided into Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg, the Benelux countries, otherwise known as the Low Countries. The Swiss are basically the same. Now we come to the big changes wrought by nationalism. In 1850, 15, there is no Germany. There is no Italy. There is an Austrian empire, but that empire uh, devolves from being the Austrian empire to becoming the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the dual monarchy where the German Austrians have to share power with the Magyar Hungarians. 
and Austria expands at the expense of the Ottoman Empire to an extent. But there is no Germany and there is no Italy. Germany and Italy were the heart of the old Holy Roman Empire, which Napoleon disbanded just before claiming the Imperium himself. So a big part of the story of the nationalism that we're going to cover is how a uh, atomized, balkanized Germany and Italy become unified nations, and how Germany becomes the chief power in all of Europe, even rivaling Britain in terms of industry and Russia in terms of raw military power. So, there's your introduction. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? I thank you. Welcome back. Uh, I hope 2021 will be a better year. 2020, you never know. You may talk quietly among yourselves until the middle. I will remind you also. If you haven't yet gotten one of these new uh, revised December 10th syllabi, you may want to come up and get one right here. And this syllabus will tell you what's coming up, which is on side two. Does it say revised 1210 on the second one? Grab 1210. Yes, does. So, if you look at the top of page two, you will note that Monday, January 4th, you have nothing but Monday, January 11th, you've got chapter survey 20 to do. Anyone else need one? Here you go. See if I can separate it out. Is that 12 4? No? Yeah, 12 10. Yes. That's good. You're all set? <laughs> you guys are all set back here? Then, uh, do you have chapter 20 ready? You will also note uh, that I took the case studies off the table, except as optional, except for AP. Have a good day. Bye-bye to you at home.